Hello all. Welcome to another exclusive webinar from GE Healthcare and SLE on HFO and closed loop O2 control. My name is Arpita Ramani. I'm from GE Healthcare, marketing leader for Life Care Solutions South Asia. In today's session, we would have the below schedule, a talk from Dr. Tingye for about 30 to 40 minutes on each of the topic that is HFO and closed loop O2, followed by Q&A. We have Professor Tingye. Professor Tinge is clinical neonatologist and respiratory physiologist interested in improving the respiratory outcomes of newborn infants. He is internationally recognized expert in physiology of the diseased neonatal lung, particularly the use of advanced mode of mechanical ventilation and imaging region lung mechanics and translating these into clinical solutions. Dr. Tinge has been awarded PhD in 2008 for his thesis on optimal application of high frequency ventilation. He is an NHMRC funded researcher who currently leads the neonatal research group at Murdoch Children's Hospital Murdoch Children's Research Institute in Melbourne. Among the most recent of his scholarly works from around 120 published articles and more relevant to our topic today are a few of below. Imaging the respiratory transition at birth, unraveling the complexities of first births of life in American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine in 2021. Transmission of oscillatory volumes in pattern lung during non-invasive high frequency ventilation in American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine in 2021 and the first definition of acute respiratory distress syndrome in neonates, which was published in Lancet Respiratory Medicine in 2017. Thank you all for joining. And thank you so much, Professor Tinge, for joining this year and looking forward to an in insightful session. Over to you, Professor Tinge, and happy learning to all. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and the um, fantastic um, invitation to speak again. Um, I'm very sorry that I can't be in person in India. It's um, been a number of years, obviously, since I've been able to visit and I, I miss it very much. It's always an amazing place to come and um, the discussions are, um, are, are fantastic. Um, I will just bear with me while I bring my slide up and I hope it all works well. I'm hoping you can see my slides now. And um, I would again just like to thank everyone for attending and thank again for the kind invitation. I know I'm a few weeks late, but I hope um, all of you have had a, a fantastic Diwali and um, have been able to celebrate it um, in a way that you've wanted to. Um, I've been asked to talk about high frequency oscillatory ventilation. I know it's a, a topic I've discussed a few times in India before. So I thought rather than go back through all the basics, I would give an update on where I think things, the, the new things may be and some of the core components that have been recently highlighted elsewhere in the literature. And this might stimulate a debate and a discussion later. Um, I will need to make a number of disclosures. Firstly, that um, my research lab here in Melbourne um, has received an SLE 5000 and a Sensomedix 3100B oscillator device for use in our um, experimental program. That's a, they've been unrestricted access and use. Um, and I've been um, I've had my travel costs um, covered for a number of workshops and conferences in the last decade by a number of manufacturers. Otherwise, I have no other conflicts of interest to disclose. I'm speaking to you from Melbourne, Australia, and I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands we may be attending this meeting and is customary here in Australia. I would like to pay my respect to the Indigenous Elders past, present and emerging. I'm currently speaking from the lands of the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nation. So as I mentioned earlier, I've broken the, the, the presenta this presentation down into a few parts. I'd like to just give a very brief overview of what high frequency is. I'm sure this is just revision for everybody, but it's always nice to go back to basics for a few small key points. I'll update where the current meta-analysis evidence in neonates um, for high frequency is. Unfortunately, there is not much new evidence, but it's worth readdressing it so we're all familiar. 
And then I will go back through again the application of the high lung volume strategy and the open lung concept. Neither of these are necessarily new ideas or new updates, but what is relevant about them is that they are now being recommended in international guidelines, when in the past they have not been, and they've been um, perceived mainly as, as, a, as, a, um, as an approach which has been more relevant to very um, high level, high frequency units. And then I'll talk about what's really new, which is the concept of high frequency volume guarantee. So I think as all of you know, um, that high frequency ventilation is a mode of ventilation. I'm sorry, I'll just get the video starting. A mode of ventilation in which the delivery of tidal volume is delivered at or near anatomical dead space at very, very fast rates that are much faster than the normal breathing effort of a human. And that's defined as more than two hertz, which is 120 breaths a minute. And you can see here a video on the left of alveoli being ventilated with conventional ventilation and alveoli being supported with high frequency. And there's a number of key components in these videos which highlight the difference between high frequency oscillatory ventilation and conventional ventilation. Firstly, you can see that the tidal breathing rate, the, 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 the breathing rate is much quicker during high frequency. The um, tidal volumes, which is the movement of those alveoli, we can clearly see is much smaller during high frequency than conventional. And the overall movement of the lung is significantly reduced. And that provides some insight into why high frequency might be lung protective, or at least was perceived at its invention to be lung protective, in that we take away the extremes of pressure and volume um, that are known to be harmful to the lungs. The reason why high frequency results in very, very small tidal volumes um, is that the wave, when um, we provide ventilation of oscillation, the wave is attenuated through the airways such that it becomes much smaller and therefore the tidal volume becomes smaller as we get to um, the end point, which is our alveoli. I'm sure this is revision for everybody, um, but we know from um, the meta-analysis, we, sorry, we now have available to us very detailed meta-analysis on um, the use of high frequency ventilation compared to conventional ventilation in preterm lung disease. And indeed, there's more trials in the meta-analysis of high frequency than any other mode of ventilation for neonatologists to look at. Um, we have now between 18 and 19 uh, trials that are included in meta-analysis, meta depending on the one that you wish to read. And importantly, we have the work from um, Kools and colleagues. Um, Kools is a, a, a Belgian neonatologist, where they've gone back and not just looked in the standard way of meta-analysis, but taken each patient out of these trials and performed an individual patient analysis to compare the benefits and the potential harms of high frequency. This is a scatter. This is the forest plot of the most published Cochrane review, which was also highlighted in the Lancet um, about 10 years ago. So again, I apologize, it's not new, but there's been no major trials since. Um, and we can see that there is a very slight benefit in survival without BPD for elective high frequency use in RDS. But that benefit is exceedingly slight and comes with a number needed to treat, which is relatively high. Um, and for, mo for that reason, most people have not moved to using high frequency as, re as um, prophylactic therapy. That's quite important because these trials are prophylactic therapy trials. So they're all designed in a way that if a, if a baby needs um, invasive ventilation, they were randomized to high frequency versus conventional at first intention. That isn't what most of us do in clinical practice. So we just need to contextualize that when we think about how we use high frequency. In fact, there's very few units in the world that would use prophylactic high frequency. Most would use it as rescue and conventional fails. What we can tell though, that, in, that there is quite a degree of heterogeneity in the outcomes of these trials, which tells us that practice and how we apply it may be very important. There is also the potential risk of harm it's very clear from the meta-analysis data that very that inappropriately applied high frequency comes with risk to the neonate. 
In particular, there's an increased risk of any air leak and severe IVH, although the IVH risk has become non-significant over time. That was a risk that was there in the earlier trials. That doesn't mean that high frequency is bad. In fact, it is telling us that it's important that we apply it appropriately. And the reason we know that is when we go down and look into the detail of these trials, there's really two sorts of application approaches in the trials. One of them is the use of a high lung volume strategy, and one is the use of a low lung volume strategy. And when the meta-analysis differentiates between those two types, there is um, a much greater risk, a much greater chance of benefit in terms of chronic lung disease um, with survival um, if high frequency is used with a high lung volume strategy. That benefit disappears when high frequency is used with a low lung volume strategy. And conversely, the risk of air leak and severe um, brain injury increases when a low lung volume strategy is used, but it disappears when a high lung volume strategy is used. So again, this is highlighting them from the meta-analysis data um, and the large trial data now that we have, that it's not just the use of the machine that matters, it's how the clinician applies the machine um, to the baby. And the onus on using high frequency safely and effectively comes down to us as clinicians and not the machine itself. And to do so, we need to apply high frequency with a high lung volume strategy in patients who have acute RDS or HMD. And again, so that's highlighting that this is these are studies in um, preterm babies with acute respiratory distress syndrome needing intubation. They are not studies that you cannot translate this data into the term baby necessarily or other lung diseases such as um, congenital diaphragmatic hernia or severe um, PIE um, or pulmonary hypoplasia. So in this population of preterm babies of RDS though, what exactly is this high lung volume strategy we need to apply? And the um, meta-analysis and all of the large trial data have used essentially the same definition, which is that you need to use at least two of the following um, uh, uh, strategies. Firstly, you should start high frequency with a higher mean airway pressure than conventional ventilation. And that's because the mean airway pressure you apply is equal to the lung volume the patient has. So a higher mean airway pressure will give a higher lung volume and there hence is the name high lung volume strategy. Um, and also that you wean FO2 before weaning mean airway pressure. And I'll come to why that's so important um, in a minute. But uh, if you do the opposite, you're in fact applying a low volume strategy. And there is the allowance of an alveolar recruitment maneuver. But this final thing is the one that's used least in the trials. And in all in the Cochrane meta-analysis, it's not actually defined what an alveolar recruitment maneuver is, which I think is a major limitation. An important component of a high lung volume strategy is that your target FO2 um, is not defined in that strategy. And indeed in the trials, their target FO2 for what defined a response to high frequency was not standardized and varied considerably. <clears throat> so the meta-analysis has told us for well more than a decade, um, indeed it's told us now for about 20 years, that we real more than 20 years that we have to use high frequency oscillatory ventilation with a high lung volume strategy in acute lung disease of prematurity. And it's provided some insight in how to and what a high lung volume strategy is, but it hasn't provided clear guidance on how to achieve it at the bedside in terms of what numbers and what dial changes one makes. And that has often been a limitation for translation in practice, in my view. And that's not unreasonable. It's not the role of the Cochrane meta-analysis or these meta-analysis to make such detailed um, recommendations. And that comes down to other sources. So while the use of a high lung volume strategy is not new, what is new is that the most recent European consensus guidelines on the management of RDS in preterm infants, which were published at the end of 2019, there is a, a comment and a recommendation. And that comment is that in high frequency, for the use of high frequency in the NICU for babies with acute RDS, an open lung approach should be used on initiation to determine the optimum mean airway pressure. 
And that is a new concept. That is a new recommendation that's not been made before. And as far as I'm aware, is not in any other guidelines anywhere in the world. So this, of course, leads to the obvious question, which is what is an open lung approach? And an open lung approach is essentially a specific way of achieving a high lung volume strategy. It's, again, not a new concept. It was first coined in 1990 by um, Burkhard Lachmann, um, uh, who is an adult intensivist or an anaesthetist um, specialising in adult intensive care therapy. And he made the comment, he said, it is our job when you have an atelectatic lung to first open the lung, find the closing pressure, reopen it, and then keep it open again from then on. And it breaks um, up, the process breaks up a number of key concepts. Firstly, the goal is to achieve lung recruitment. So you take a lung that is atelectatic and you recruit it. The next part of it, though, is to identify the lowest pressure that maintains that recruitment, and that's defined as the optimum pressure or P-opt. Um, so it's not just about finding recruitment, it's then about finding the lowest mean airway pressure that will maintain that recruitment. And it does so by exploiting a physiological concept of the lung called hysteresis. And it exploits the concept of end expiratory pressure or mean airway pressure, which is the expiratory phenomenon that maintains recruitment during the respiratory cycle. So what does it mean at the bedside? And here is a, a case example of how one can apply an open lung concept to achieve a high lung volume strategy on initiating high frequency oscillatory ventilation in the context of what the current European guidelines recommend. So we have, and I know I've presented this in India before, um, so because I think it's a very good illustration, so I apologise if you've seen the slides before. Um, this is a 28-weeker who's about a kilo, who was intubated at one hour of age um, after failing non-invasive ventilation, and on conventional ventilation had a mean airway pressure of 12 centimetres of water, which would correlate, as many of you would know, if you're using a PEEP of six or thereabouts, to a... Um, to a, to a PIP, which would be over 25. And for most people, that um, is roughly the threshold where people start to get a little bit anxious about the potential risk of um, volume trauma from, um, tidal, from conventional tidal ventilation. So the clinical team have decided to change the baby to high frequency because the baby's in, still in a lot of oxygen and not saturating very well. And the question then, of course, is, well, that's a good decision probably and don't have any problems with that, but what are the numbers you have to set on the bedside? And as you recall, the high lung volume strategy in the Cochrane doesn't necessarily give us specific numbers, but it does say that to do a high lung volume strategy, it's important that you commence at a higher mean airway pressure than on conventional. So most of us would start at a number bigger than 12. And the number that most of us pick is somewhere about two to four centimetres above that number on conventional. And that's been historical practice for many years. And I think most of us, if we put our hands on our heart, would say that it's not unreasonable that, we, that the team picked 14 because that's what most of us would probably do. That's two above. The question, though, is that that's your first decision. And the open lung says that's not your only decision because you don't know at that point in time if that baby is getting the right uh, numbers or not. We don't know that 14 is the best. It could be higher. It could be uh, 13. It could indeed be 12. We don't know. We just know we need to pick a number higher than 12. So the open lung approach is really about listening to the patient and getting feedback from the patient and letting the patient tell us how to get things right rather than the other way around. So they start at a mean airway pressure of 14, and indeed there's an improvement in FO2. It comes down slightly and the saturations have improved, as, as you'd expect. And the team now has a number of decisions. They first have to ask ourselves, have we optimised mean airway pressure? And if we answer the case no, then we probably need to change our mean airway pressure setting. If we think the baby is optimised, we don't need to make any changes. And there's two ways you could do that from here. One, you could say, well, why don't we just leave the baby for a while and see what happens? Um, how long should you wait? 
Uh, generally, in a very preterm baby, if you're not that, you will find that the lung recruitment component will stabilize within a few minutes. And in this case, I would not wait more than five to 10 minutes because at that point, I would be able to see exactly whether this baby is improving. But I'd be quite comfortable here at this stage of the game to say, look, the baby's got a little bit better, but 80% oxygen is still pretty poor um, for a preterm baby. So we've had some effect, but not a great effect. And probably the mean airway pressure is not optimised. When the baby started on conventional in 100% oxygen, I assume the baby had atelectatic lung disease. The fact that I've given the baby a little bit more mean airway pressure and the oxygenation's got better is telling me from the baby, the baby's probably had some lung recruitment because an increase in mean airway pressure that results in improvement in oxygenation in, in acute lung disease is nearly always lung recruitment. So I've shown the baby has lungs that can recruit and I've shown that the baby has some recruitability but I probably haven't got things as good as they could be because 80% is not what I normally see. So why don't I see, why don't, how I, I could reasonably say that I don't think in this case 14 is going to be good enough. And the open lung would say, well, then you should cautiously start increasing mean airway pressure because lung recruitment's related to the mean airway pressure you set. So the open lung concept um, that is published in the EU guidelines is based on ones that have come out of um, Switzerland and the Netherlands, which I'll get to in a minute. And the general rule uh, in a preterm baby is that you would change the mean airway pressure or the FO2 every one to two minutes and assess response. So at the mean airway pressure of 14, the baby improved. If the FO2 would stabilise, that, that means the saturations would stabilise and you weren't needing to wean the FO2 anymore, then you would go up by a mean airway pressure of two centimetres of water to 16. You would wait one to two minutes, generally two minutes, reassess the baby's response. If the baby has shown an improvement in saturations, you would wean your FO2 accordingly. Um, if it's a small wean in FO2 and things are stabilised, you keep recruiting your mean airway pressure. If you've made a big wean in the FO2, you give it a minute or two for the baby's saturations to stabilise and then you decide what to do again. But your premise will be that in this stage to keep meaning, increasing the mean airway pressure approximately every two minutes <clears throat> whilst you assess the oxygen response in the baby. And that's because an increase in mean airway pressure and improvement in oxygenation means that you've improved lung recruitment and you've shown that you've got more lung volume. So you can keep going until you get to a point where the lung becomes distended, over distended. And indeed, and that's generally defined as a point where you get no further improvements in oxygenation and you're unable to wean your FO2 anymore, or the baby starts to desaturate, which is an acute sign of over distension. And the team did that, and over about 10 to 15 minutes, they were able to get the baby to a mean air pressure of 20. And at that point, they had better saturations and an FO2 of 50%, which is showing us and telling us that the lung was recruitable, and in fact, has been recruited by doing that, and needed a much higher mean air pressure than 14 to achieve lung recruitment. They just went up by one centimetre of water and the baby started to desaturate. That's telling us now that the change we've made to the baby is causing some decompensation. And given the lung has been recruiting, it's most likely now that we're taking the lung to a point of over distinction. There's clearly no benefit for this baby to keep increasing your mean airway pressure because it doesn't improve oxygenation. It may be harming oxygenation and will probably start to cause some problems with blood pressure as well. So at this point, you could stay at 20 and say, well, look, I've recruited the lung. I've done really well. That's fantastic. But um, that's not the way to go. <clears throat> and that's because the lung is a non-linear organ. It's an organ of motion that's non-linear. And the other component of the open lung approach is it is a way of dynamically mapping the um, lung volume and the way to optimize lung recruitment. So you can see here this pressure volume relationship, which is from one of uh, my work earlier, um, where we mapped the pressure volume relationship in babies with measures of lung volume during um, high frequency. And there's some um, electron microscopy data, which is not from babies. This is just um, from, from um, other respiratory things. Um, you can see how you'd expect the alveolar to look. Um, I'll just um, bring up my little pointer um, and try to show it to you. Uh, you can see right down here when the lung's atelectatic, 
you expect a very low lung volume and you can't see much lung volume uh, in the alveolar spaces. As we recruit the lung by increasing the inner pressure, we start to gain an increase in alveolar volume till you get to the point of um, over distinction. And this curve that we mapped in babies um, back in, uh, in my previous work was repeated by uh, Martijn Medema and Anton van Kam in the Netherlands in a population of preterm babies. And you see the absolute similarities in the two curves. The only difference you can see here is that this is a curve of lung volume and this is a curve of oxygenation and proves that oxygenation is a good default mechanism of measuring lung volume. Now, once the lung is recruited and over distended, if you decrease the pressure that the lungs applies exposed to, the lung behaves differently in terms of its volume response. And it has this concept of hysteresis. This is the inflation limb and this is the deflation limb. And you can see as we come down in pressure down the deflation limb, lung volume is preserved. <clears throat> and it is always higher at every mean airway pressure than it was during the recruitment or inflation phase. And that lung volume will maintain preservation until you get to a critical pressure where the lung collapses again, which is called the closing pressure of the lung. So we can see that now we've recruited the lung, we're at that high amino air pressure. If we started bringing our amino air pressure down, we should be able to maintain that lung recruitment at least up to a point and hopefully expose the lung to a low amino air pressure, which would make everyone uh, much more comfortable because we don't like babies being at very high amino air pressures. And indeed, that's what the group did, and this has been reproduced many, many times. Um, they made a series of stepwise decreases every two minutes. From a practical point of view, what you do differently now is you leave your FO2 at the lowest FO2 you could achieve. And in this group, it was up uh, 40%. Um, often when you drop down a couple of points, mean anyway, pressure points, the FO2 improves a bit. You don't now change your FO2. You stay there because that's the lowest you've got. You decrease your mean anyway, pressure by two every two, two minutes in, term ba in preterm babies until you get to the point where your oxygenation um, is starting to drop. And that could be identified here. You can see that they went 18, there's 14, 12 and 10. And oxygenation is really good during all of these, but it looks like it might be starting to worsen at a mean air pressure of 10. And when they went to eight centimetres of water, indeed, the baby decompensated. And that is because now you've taken the baby into a state of atelectasis again. So we now can clearly see that the baby needed a mean airway pressure of 20 to recruit the lung and open it up. And a mean airway pressure of somewhere about 10 to 14 was optimal for this baby. It gave us the best oxygenation for the lowest mean airway pressure. And we've achieved a high lung volume strategy here. We have increased, we've used a mean airway pressure greater than unconventional. We've used a recruitment manoeuvre. And we've also weaned our FO2 before we weaned mean airway pressure. This is where we weaned our FO2. We've just done it very quickly. We obviously don't want to leave our baby here um, because things are not so good now. Now, we could slowly step the lung back up again, but we don't need to do that because we know that 20 was safe in this baby and uh, gave the best response for recruitment. This lung is atelectatic. We can't just go back to 14 again. That just takes us back to here where things were pretty dire. So we need to go up to this high opening pressure, but we can do it immediately. Um, if you're feeling uncomfortable with that, you could do it in two steps. You could go 16 and then 20 or something like that. But most of us just go straight up to this pressure of, in this case, 20. And we wait until our oxygenation is improved and our FO2 can be weaned down again. Now we know where to go. We don't have to go all the way down to eight. And we know that somewhere around that sort of 10 to 14 mark was perfect. And the traditional teaching is that you would set your mean final mean air pressure between two and five centimetres above the one that caused deoxygenation or derecruitment. And indeed, they did that. They set it at 11. And you can see the baby's now in 40% and has good saturation, significantly better than when we started. And this whole procedure can take about 30 minutes. So that's the open lung response approach that's um, mentioned in the EU guidelines now. Um, and it comes from no clinical trial data. So there's no randomized controls of this. I suspect there will never be a randomized control of this, although there was a randomized control published um, two years ago in uh, Lancet Respiratory Medicine, which was a randomized trial of giving um, 
um, <clears throat> insure surfactant. Um, and the babies were either randomised to insure surfactant using the traditional method or insure surfactant where at, in at intubation, they did an open lung manoeuvre using the height, um, what I just went through um, over about 10 to 15 minutes and then gave the surfactant. And then both arms were the same with the intention to extubate as quickly as possible, which is built into insure. And as some of you probably know from that study, there was a significant reduction in um, the potential, uh, there was a significant benefit, sorry, for the babies who were in the open lung approach with high frequency transiently and insure. There was a reduction in BPD. There was a reduction in short-term measures need for reintubation and so forth. And um, that, so that's um, telling us that's the only randomised controlled trial we have of any form of open lung approach and high frequency in, in neonates. And it does tell us that the therapy probably does work uh, and confers um, with the animal data around the use of open lung ventilation for um, lung recruitment and surfactant distribution. But the original studies were all observational studies. The first study came from Peter Rimmensberger, now more than 22 years old. Um, which was the first study to describe the mechanisms I've just went through, this use of mean airway pressure steps every one to two minutes, titrating your FO2, and um, they compared this as their new standard practice in their unit against historical data from their unit in Switzerland and showed that there was uh, less ventilator days and lower oxygen dependency and less chronic lung disease. It can't, can't conclude from this trial design that that was due to the open lung approach, but we can conclude that transient high mean airway pressures up to 25 centimetres of water were well tolerated in preterm infants. Um, we published data in term babies using this response in the Blue Journal in 2006 um, and, and um, showed that two to four centimetres of water above the um, closing pressure or the point, the mean airway pressure of desaturation was indeed the best point to target in terms of volume, saturations and lung mechanics. And shortly after that, Anton van Kam's group in the Netherlands published a large series of preterm babies um, using a similar open lung approach. Um, they defined the optimum mean airway pressure as the mean airway pressure that gave an FO2 less than 25%. They were able to achieve that in 75% of babies and indeed in 30% of babies pre-surfactant their FO, sorry, 90%, 98% of babies, their FO2 is less than 30%. And again, we can't conclude that there was a benefit in chronic lung disease because it wasn't a randomised trial, um, but um, that they were able to show that it was feasible and safe in preterm infants to do these forms of relatively aggressive recruitment using oxygenation. So together we have that set of data. As I've said to you, um, the traditional teaching is that the mean airway pressure step should be every one to two minutes roughly, um, and then a decision should be made about what to do with mean airway pressure or whether oxygen needs to be changed first. And that data has been um, shown to be, to be correct from an observational study of the Dutch group um, where they recorded lung volume change over time and showed that it has stabilised well within two minutes in, in preterm infants. We recently published some data on term babies, predominantly with meconium aspiration syndrome, where we also recorded how long it took for the lung volume to stabilise after a mean airway pressure change during these open lung manoeuvres. So lots of mean airway pressure changes were made and evaluated. And in these term babies, we found it took much longer for mean airway pressure to stabilise, which you'd expect in big babies with longer time constants. And indeed, in some instances, it's needed more than 10 minutes. And we we didn't allow the mean airway pressure to be um, kept at any mean airway pressure level for more than 10 minutes. So we had to extrapolate our data using modelling. And in, with the modelling, we found that some babies needed 30 minutes per step. So the take-home message from that is in older babies, more mature babies, particularly ones with more complex lung disease like MAS, if you're going to do an open lung recruitment manoeuvre, you should probably adapt your mean airway pressure changes to at least five minutes in turn, babies. But I suspect ideally 10 minutes is about the right setting, and that may even be a little bit short in some babies. And it is important to remember that the term infant is a popular population for high frequency, and it's an under-recognised need in the community. I think as in the research community, I think as clinicians, we're all very aware that term babies receive high frequency. We use it quite a lot for, for severe lung disease like pneumonia and MAS, um, and we also use it for some complex congenital diseases like um, 
CDH. We don't have much data, though, on the use of term babies, but we do have some work that we've been doing in the Neonatal ARDS project, which is an international project, trying to define whether um, the, the, the true definition of NARDS or neonatal ARDS in our population, in the neonatal population. And as was said at the introduction, we published that definition a number of years ago. It's a consensus international definition. And we're just in the process of um, attempting to publish um, our first um, validation data of that um, definition. And that's a a data set of 239 prospectively cons uh, uh, recruited infants within the sites um, involved in the NARDS definition. And here you can see some of the ventilation data from this population of babies with neonatal ARDS. Um, the vast majority of them were uh, on or receiving high frequency at the time of their diagnosis. And NARDS is a very serious disease. Um, they've got much higher FO2s and worse OIs and a higher mortality than preterm lung disease. Um, and the majority, and there was an increase in high frequency use as their disease progressed to their point of maximum um, disease state. Interestingly, you can see in this complex table here, I apologize, um, that the mean airway pressures being used uh, at uh, in this population of babies with neonatal ARDS was quite high, com especially compared to preterm um, HFOV data. The mean mean airway pressure was 17, um, and um, it didn't matter whether it was direct or indirect NARDS. Um, infectious NARDS had a lower uh, mean airway pressure than non-infectious NARDS, which is what you'd expect. MAS, for example, would be non-infectious NARDS whilst um, a secondary um, mnemonic, a secondary um, sepsis would be an infectious NARDS. And the mean airway pressure increased as the severity of the ARDS increased in this cohort of babies, with the most severe babies needing very high mean airway pressures of 19. There is a group of babies in whom we should never use a high lung volume strategy, and they are babies in whom we would never do a lung recruitment manoeuvre. A lung recruitment manoeuvre is only indicated for atelectasis. So if you have a baby with pulmonary hypertension, primary uh, pulmonary hyperplasia, primary pulmonary hypertension or CEH, you should never do an aggressive lung recruitment manoeuvre. Indeed, in some of these babies, we would use a mean airway pressure at or below conventional. So it's important we understand when a therapy is appropriate and when it is not. An open lung manoeuvre and a high lung volume strategy is designed to recruit collapsed alveoli. It will not recruit alveoli which are just not there or which are hyperplastic. So I'm going to move on and talk about um, volume guarantee, which is a new modality available on most oscillators now. Um, and I know that the SLE uh, 6000 includes a, a high frequency VG mode. Um, so to remember, to understand um, VG and high frequency, we need to understand how CO2 is being removed during high frequency. And it is different from conventional. We have an oscillatory wave. <coughs> And in that wave, we have a stroke volume. And it is that volume that it determines the amount of CO2 removal. Um, we, the CO2 removal is dependent on the minute ventilation, which is called DCO2 in high frequency, which is equal to the frequency times the square of the tidal volume. So what this means practically is that if we increase our amplitude, we will increase our tidal volume, and therefore you can see our stroke volume improves, uh, increases, you'd expect a higher DCO, and therefore you'd expect more CO2 to remove. Unlike conventional, though, our area under the curve is also dependent on how many breaths per minute we're applying. So if we increase our frequent, if we decrease our frequency, sorry, we will have longer in inflation and expiration for each breath or cycle. And you will see here at the same delta P, you will have an increase in the stroke volume and therefore more tidal, ventil tidal volume is being delivered and our DCO2 will um, decrease. These two are not uh, independent of each other like they are in conventional. So most current hybrid devices are offering some form of volume targeted ventilation in high frequency. Again, we have no large prospective trials for efficacy or safety. There is one large trial called the Dove trial, um, which is a US trial, which has completed recruitment, but is not yet published as far as I'm aware. I looked just last or two days ago to see in case something popped up. That will be a, that is purely a, sign, a trial of safety. It's not designed to be a trial of efficacy. And we also have no comparison <coughs> of different ways of doing this. <coughs> Excuse
excuse me. So we're going to have to look at um, observational data and experiential data. We are now starting to see some small trials coming out that are comparing um, high frequency of volume guarantee um, against different short-term outcomes or, or measures. One of the older ones was a trial that showed that um, high frequency volume guarantee was actually able to do what it said it could do, which was to stabilise tidal ventilation across a different a range of frequencies. You remember from my last slide, I said that when you change your frequency, you will change your tidal volume. You would expect the a VG algorithm to see, if you've asked it to say at its constant tidal volume, which you can see here in the graph from these data, that as you increase your frequency, you would hope that it would readjust the delta P accordingly so the tidal volume stays constant. When rather than what you've we've traditionally seen, which is as you decrease your frequency at the same delta P, the tidal volume goes up. <clears throat> so this is the first data we have to show that these modes are able to do that what the manufacturers say. We have a number of very small crossover trials showing that tidal volume and DCO2 um, are not only higher but more stable when volume guarantee is active. Um, we have one trial um, that was published uh, last year that says that showed there was no correlation between tidal volume DCO2 and PCO2. And we have um, a Chinese data set, again, not very high, large in numbers, which suggests that the number of hypocarbic and hypocapnic episodes are much lower. This trial reported a change in death or BPD, but I would take a very large grain of salt into how we interpret that. The more important thing is, and I think because this is one of the things that we would hope that these trial, that this mode would be able to do, which is reduce the swings of extremes that can happen in babies on high frequency. As I said, we've got a number of trials, including this trial from um, Colin Morley's group in Cambridge, showing that when the volume guarantee is turned on in high frequency, it does actually approximate um, the set tidal volume. So we can trust these devices that if we set two mil per kilo or two and a half mil per kilo, whatever number during it, that the machine will actually deliver what we think, what we ask it to. So we, we know these the, the machines that are available on the market at the moment are highly accurate. There's a number of considerations for us as clinicians though. Firstly, most of us are very used to using volume targeted ventilation and conventional. We've been doing it for many decades. We're pretty good at it and we know it really helps babies. They are not the same modes. We can't assume that what we do on conventional will work on high frequency of volume guarantee. And that's because unlike conventional, our tidal volume is influenced by our frequency, our IE ratio, the size of the patient and the disease we're treating, and the endotracheal tube size. All of these things have a, have a related impact on vol tidal volume delivery. <clears throat> there is some interesting data from um, Jane Pillow's group showing that mathematically, at least and physiologically, that we should be targeting a DCO2 in babies on high frequency of 40 to 60 mils squared per kilo squared per second. That's a really hard number to get your head around because it is not just your DCO2 divided by weight. It's much more complicated than that. Um, and practically, it's really hard to do, but it gives us a rough guide. Um, but that's very hard, furthermore, very hard because when you change your frequency, you change your upper and lower limit of what the probable tidal volume you need to achieve that state, that target DCO2 will be. And this is why personally at the moment, I'm a little bit uncomfortable about the guidelines that recommend starting at a set tidal volume in every baby, because if I'm using a frequency of 12 uh, and a half or 13 hertz, then the upper and lower limit of the tidal volume I need that will probably give the right CO2 clearance is about two mil per kilo. But you can see here in a much lower frequency, it's getting to a much higher value. So we need to bear in mind this relationship between frequency and tidal volume. <clears throat> and because of that, um, we have two proposed algorithms. 
My preference at the moment is to use algorithm A, which I'll go through second, which is the one that we would use on our unit. But the other algorithm that's recommended in the literature and by people at the moment is to initially start high frequency with volume guarantee when you put a baby on the oscillator and to set it somewhere between two and two and a half mil per kilo, two mil per kilo and high frequencies, two and a half for lower frequencies. Adjust your delta P to the upper limit, which gives you that to to ensure that the tidal volume uh, will maintain constant, which just like in conventional volume guarantee, you would set your V, your upper limit of your pressure at five or thereabouts centimetre of water above what you think the patient needs. Um, and then you watch to make sure that the volume guarantee that you set is being achieved. You stabilise the baby, you set your frequency for the disease and the size of the baby, you note your DSU data, and then you go on and you measure your CO2 to be sure that that's all safe and that you've achieved what you want to do, which is what you do in without volume guarantee. Once we've set all our numbers, we would measure CO2 of a blood gas or transcutaneous CO2. The alternative, which is the one that I currently use because um, it's a novel technique still that we're still using, is we start high frequency without it, but with all of our monitoring in place, our TCO2 and all the other things in place. And that's because we've been doing high frequency for 40 years in our unit. We're very comfortable doing high frequency. We don't want to change and we've never used volume target ventilation until recently. So we start without it. We stabilize the baby. We get all of our other numbers right, our frequency um, set and all of those components. We then adjust our delta P till we get the CO2 that we think is appropriate for the baby. Um, and that might require doing a blood gas. None of this takes too long. Once we've got the baby's CO2 stable, we then will start volume target ventilation at the tidal volume that the machine is measuring at that point in time, and we'll set our pressure limit at five centimetres of water above the delta P we're needing to give the correct um, um, type CO2 value, and then we monitor our ongoing progress. In both of these modes, if your tide approaches, once you've got going, if your tidal volume alarm is low, um, then you need to check your patient to make sure they're ventilating, you don't have an obstructed tube or so forth, and increase your delta P. If you change your frequency, because frequency and tidal volume are interdependent, then you need to alter your set tidal volume to maintain the DCO2 value that was giving you the right CO2 before. And you may, if we change frequency during volume guarantee, we would always do a blood gas at some point afterwards to be sure that the set tidal volume that we had before hasn't now gone out of range. And that's because, as I showed you in that last slide, you will get at a different frequency, you will need a different tidal volume to give a stable CO2. And you can see the same here if you do option B, you measure CO2, if your CO2 is high, then you increase, you look at whether you need to adjust your mean airway pressure, your deep, your, your tidal volume setting, or your of delta P. And if it's low, then um, again, you need to readjust your tidal volume and consider whether your mean airway pressure is appropriate. This is not again new data, but I show this frequently at talks because I think people find it useful. How do I set the frequency? We often forget about it, um, but it is actually really important. I could talk for an hour just on this. Um, this is my unit's guide, and it's one that we've used for many years. I know it's one that other um, people who use high frequency a lot use as well, like Peter Rimmensberger and Peter Dargaville and Jane. So if a baby has preterm HMD, we would normally start the frequency between 12 and 15 because that's the appropriate one for their time constant. It also exposes, it risks, uh, minimizes the risk of high tidal volume exposure, which obviously we're worried about in this group of babies. If I'm using one of the Draeger devices, I tend to start uh, lower because they're not quite um, the same in the way they generate high frequency and there is more of an effect of frequency on delivered tidal volumes. We tend to use a slightly lower um, frequency for the same condition. If we have very early PIE in a preterm baby, the big risk for lung injury here is volume trauma. So the best way to avoid volume trauma in high frequency is to use a high frequency setting because you'll give a much lower uh, tidal volume. So we tend to start at a reasonably high frequency, generally about 14 or 13. Um, if we have very established cystic BPD in an older pre preterm baby, we would normally apply a frequency of eight and sometimes we drop it below eight but that's only in cystic, established cystic nasty BPD in older babies. If we have a baby of term lung disease, 
we tend to set between 12 and um, 8. Generally, we would start at 10 centimetres of water for pneumonia and other conditions and CDH and so forth. Um, if we have MAS, we generally drop our um, frequency down by one from what we think we'd need for a term baby. The other question we often get asked is why will you, do you ever extubate from high frequency directly or do you go to conventional? In our unit, our preference is to extubate straight from high frequency as our default. We don't always do that, but that's our default. And the reason being is that high frequency is CPAP with wiggle. So, and there's no reason why you can't extubate. Now, do I, have, I don't have trial data for this, but we have a large observational study from the Netherlands, um, which is now quite old, where they studied 200 babies who were preterm who had open lung high frequency and they were extubated directly from high frequency when they had a mean airway pressure of eight or less, they were in 30% oxygen or less, they had minimal delta P and they had satisfactory work of breathing of a normal CO2 and the success for extubation was 90% in that study and indeed most, as you all know from, our work with, from your own work with preterm babies, successfully extubating at 90% is a pretty impressive outcome. Now, it hasn't been tested in further than that, but this is generally a protocol that's used around the world. In our unit, we apply in term babies. Um, we use the same FO2 requirement, unless the baby's got another unique lung disease, but we allow them to have a higher amino air pressure because they have better intrinsic work of breathing, a slightly higher delta P, and again, they have to be breathing adequately by themselves before we'd extubate them. We find that this guide, this approach generally works pretty well, but we haven't published that outcome. So in summary, high frequency is now established as a rescue therapy. Um, it's in diseases of atelectasis, we should do so with a high lung volume strategy and um, an open lung approach should be the preferred approach to a high lung volume strategy. Volume guarantee has substantial therapeutic benefits and current devices appear to be able to deliver the modality accurately, which means we can start using it, but we shouldn't just assume it's the same as conventional and we have no long-term efficacy data to help guide us with the use of volume guarantee. So thank you very much. That concludes the first talk. Um, I will defer to the um, organisers, but I think they were hoping I would go on and start on the next presentation on oxygen and then have the Q&A after. Is that correct? Yes, yes, please. You can continue and we will have the uh, Q&A later. Okay, I will do that. And... Um, um, just bear with me while I open that presentation up. So we're going to change tact for the next sort of 20 minutes or thereabouts or 25 minutes and talk about um, how we can manage oxygen exposure in the NICU. Um, again, I will point out some disclosures related to this topic. Um, we currently use the SLE Oxygeni algorithm in our unit as part of a trial that we are um, leading with uh, Peter Dargavu on Hobart, Tasmania here. He's the predominant lead and we're the site leads for this trial, it's, but it's been performed on our site. Um, so I've been using it in a trial capacity and as I said, I've taught in some workshops in the past. So for those of us who work in the NICU and been doing so for a long time, we know that neonatologists have had a bit of a love-hate relationship with oxygen. We know that oxygen is essential for survival and we have a population of babies, of patients characterised by hypoxic respiratory failure. And indeed, oxygen is the most prescribed drug in the NICU. But the history of oxygen in the NICU is quite interesting. I won't go into details, and I'm sure most of you know it. Um, oxygen was being used very liberally after World War II when it became available due to the technologies that came about during the war, that it was possible to save babies that we'd not been able to save before from respiratory failure at birth. It then became apparent from a wonderful set of observational studies by um, uh, done here in Melbourne by uh, Campbell here, who some of you may know, um, who was an instrumental pioneer in both neonatology, but also in um, women in paediatrics, that there was a higher rate of uh, retinopathy of prematurity in the babies that were being exposed to very liberal oxygen use. She very nicely documented that. It was then explored much further by Silverman in the US. And that really led, it was his work that really led to the concept of evidence-based data being used to apply um, um, 
clinical therapies in the NICU, who was a real pioneer of that. And that was because when suddenly everyone realised that there was eye damage due to uh, exposure to liberal oxygen, people start, stopped using it, and then babies started either dying or having poor outcomes. And we went from having a problem with babies who were being blind to a problem with babies who weren't surviving. And indeed, it was shown that in that period of the 50s and 60s, when we moved from stopping to use our oxygen and being afraid of it, that for every baby whose eyesight was saved, we were losing nine babies to either death or severe brain injury. And consequently, there's been a lot of toing and froing around how to use oxygen. We understand how oxygen, inappropriate oxygen causes ROP, but we really don't have a good idea about why uh, inappropriate hypoxemia and hyperoxemia um, cause mortality in these babies. Part of the problem with applying oxygen safely in the NICU is we don't have a direct feedback mechanism. The clinical decision that we need to make, um, and I'll just bring my little pointer thing up again, the clinical decision we make is to set the FO2. That's our job as clinicians. We need to give the right FO2 to treat the baby's uh, disease. It might have if it has a hypoxic disease, but we want to do so in a way that's safe. When we apply, make a change to FO2, that FO2 enters the lungs, it diffuses across into the um, arteries and um, is expressed as a change in the arterial pressure of oxygen. This is something we intermittently measure in some babies, but we never continuously measure. And in many babies, we never measure at all. That PaO2 will either confer a benefit for the baby if we've made a good decision, the hypoxemia may resolve, or it may expose the baby to risk, whether that's from ROP or not enough oxygen or too much oxygen for some other mechanism. We then get a feedback because this is not our feedback mechanism because we're unable to measure it. We get some guidance as to whether this was the right thing or the wrong thing to do. And as we all know, it is pulse oximetry that gives us that feedback and it's the oxygen saturations that we use to make decisions around the FO2 changes we need to make. But the relationship between SpO2 and FO2 is not as clear as the relationship between, uh, is not as uh, definitive as the relationship between PO2 and FO2. And the relationship between PO2 and FO2 is not linear. A small change in FO2 does not always result in a small change in PO2. It depends where you are on the oxygen, um, deoxygen, uh, on the uh, oxyhemoglobin PO2 curve. And as you all know, that that curve is individualized in each patient. It's changed by lots of factors, not all of which are related to the FO2 that we set, but other factors intrinsic in the patient. And this nonlinear relationship makes it very hard for us to appreciate exactly what the right change and how big a change should be. Furthermore, apart from the intrinsic problems with SpO2 as a way of monitoring things, um, it's a peripheral monitor and it's changing a lot uh, in, especially in preterm babies. So it can be often very hard to keep up with these fluctuations as a clinician or to know whether the fluctuations are meaningful or not. Despite this, though, we're stuck with oxygen saturations as a way of knowing what the right way to set FO2 is in the NICU. Here we do have good, high-quality, randomised control trial data. And we have a number of large trials that were conducted that have all been pulled together into the Neoprom collaboration. This data is not new, it's been around for a while. And these large trials combined of almost 5,000 babies compared high FO2 saturation ranges, target ranges from 91 to 95 versus a lower one of 85 to 95. Um, they trials were conducted over almost 10 years. And they showed that there was no significant difference in death or major disability um, targeting either of these ranges of saturations. Disability didn't include ROP, but when we broke the primary outcome measure down into its two components, there was a significant reduction in mortality when the higher SpO2 range was used compared to the lower, and that was after adjustment for some of the in the design problems in these trials were related to the pulse oximeter that was used, as some of you probably know about. There was no difference in disability, major disability though. So there is a reduction in mortality, but not disability from targeting a lower, a higher saturation range. Sub secondary analysis showed that uh, the lower saturation range resulted in less treated ROP and um, less need for supplementary oxygen at 36 weeks, 
whilst targeting the higher range resulted in a more mortality, as I said, and also higher NEC and some other significant secondary outcomes. So as a consequence, targeting a lower saturation range increased mortality, may increase NEC, and it did not alter disability after discharge and reduced ROP. Balancing all these things together, most of us have interpreted that the appropriate saturation range to use is 91 to 95, and that should be the target range we use in preterm babies, because many of us weight, we weight mortality much higher than these other outcome measures. But when we look at these trial outcomes, we need to say, were the interventions appropriately applied? And the interventions here were two different target saturation ranges. Then here you can see the um, accumulative uh, oxygen saturation curves for each study. These are cumulative data for both groups that the babies are in and, um, and how frequent it was that a baby was in, the, in a particular saturation range at that, uh, during the study. And we can see that many times the babies were out of their target range. And indeed, in some of the um, Australian and UK data, babies actually very frequently were um, quite close together. <coughs> <laughs> and the curves were quite wide, which is telling us that maybe it's really hard, even in a trial where the clinicians are aware they're in a trial and being observed for accuracy, to actually keep your saturations where you want them to be. And we have some nice data from um, Hobart in Tasmania, which shows how hard it is for us to keep our saturations in the range we want them to be. This is observational data from preterm babies. We can see this histogram of oxygen saturations and the proportion of time in the study that babies were in that range. At this point in this unit, they were targeting a lower saturation range. And you can see that actually the majority of time, baby saturations were outside of that range, even though the clinicians were told to target it. And in fact, if a baby was in oxygen, they were only in their target range a third of the time. Two thirds of the time, they were too high with their oxygen saturations. So clinicians were two times more likely to be outside of your target range than in it. And there were a number of human factors which were important in these findings. Firstly, they found that prolonged hyperoxia was less likely with nurse-patient ratios of one-to-one, -one, which is what one would expect because the staff were able to focus on more things to do with one particular patient. And also the chance of being eupoxic or having your target saturation range improved as the nursing experience uh, increased. And I think all of us know that um, an excellent experienced neonatal nurse is worth their weight in gold. And this is some data to suggest that's true. So it might be that the human components are important here in achieving uh, the target saturations. It might just be that humans have got too many other things to do or are unable to keep up with the fluctuations that are occurring. So let's look at this cycle again of setting the desired FO2. It could, we then make a change on a ventilator, a machine, that then initiates a change of FO2 going to the patient. That changes what's happening in the patient, our outcome, and that in this case will be our PaO2. That will presumably have a change in oxygen saturations. That's then measured on our oximetry. This is our feedback loop here. And we then get that number, which we interpret as an input, and we make a decision. We're the controller. What if we took away the human and put a computer in there, a slave robot that was able to take this data and determine what the right change was gonna be. And then if that slave robot was built into the machine, the machine would make the change in FO2 and the loop is going on without a human being involved. There is some logic here. The logic is that it's been asked to only do one thing. It's um, a very mathematical decision and computers like maths to do. Um, and computers are able to process things very quickly. And if they're only doing one thing, they can look at the SpO2 many, many times a minute when a human is unlikely ever to be able to do that because they've got too many other things to do. So there's some logic here. The difficulty is, as I've sort of pointed out earlier, that the relationship between SpO2 and PaO2 is not as simple as everyone thinks. And the relationship between PaO2 and FO2 is, is non-linear, but determined by the oxygen dissociation curve. But the concept of automating how we give oxygen is not new. It's been around for many, many decades. We now are in a position where we have 
um, computer algorithms and the technology that allow us to do this. And there's many different devices on the market who are able to automate oxygen control. And this is what they do. Here's what happens um, for a patient who's on manual control. We can see in the dark uh, black line are uh, SpO2s. And you can see over a two hour period here that they're moving around a lot. This is pretty common in preterm babies. Here's our target range here. And you can see that the baby is going into target range, above target range, below target range. Things are changing quite a lot. Um, our FO2 is down here. There is only one, two, three FO2 changes occurring in that two hour period, despite the fact that the saturations are changing a lot. With an automated system, we still see this same variability in oxygen saturation in this graph here. Babies going in and out of target range. You could possibly convince yourself that there's less out of range um, black lines here. But what we see that's really different is see how the FO2 is changing frequently and rapidly, much more often than a human can do it. And all of the studies have shown the same thing, um, that um, baby, the automated systems change the FO2 many fold higher than um, um, manual systems. The other advantage of an automated system is it can try to replicate what a human does, which is to understand why the baby is behaving erratically. So here we have a very stable saturation curve very minimal changes in FO2, suddenly the baby becomes much more erratic and unstable. And we think presumably something's going on here. Maybe the baby's got a blocked tube or needs secretions taken out or something like that. I don't know. But you can see that the algorithm here, and this is using the Oxygeni one, it's data from Peter Dadago and Hobart, this is the SLE system, um, is showing very nicely that the system is now increasing its importance in its change. So here it's making small changes often. Now it's making big changes because it's perceived things have changed. And we can see here in the oxygen uh, histograms that with an automated system um, in this data from this paper, we are much more likely to stay in our target range and have less oxygen, uh, if less saturations that are outside of range compared to manual control. So we now have a number of manufacturers who produced um, our, uh, our oxygen control algorithms. In fact, pretty much every neonatal manufacturer has one now, um, and they've all got different names. They um, essentially three different types though. The original old ones, such as the one that's on the AVIA, is what's called a rule-based or fuzzy logic algorithm, um, which measures the error. An error in these algorithms is the difference between the mean SpO2 range that you set, so in the case of 91 to 95, it would be um, 93, and the measured SpO2. So if it's 93 and you've, the mean is 93, the error is zero, and obviously bigger or smaller um, changes that error. It then adjusts the FO2 based on the magnitude of that error using a series of pre-designed rules, which are basically yes, no questions. And that's an old long-standing way of computer programs to make decisions. Um, the two more modern algorithms, which are relatively similar in what they do, um, one is called a proportional integral differential or PID algorithm, which is the one in the Oxygeni. That one likewise measures the error. Um, it then also calculates the integral of the error and the behavior in oxidation and the derivative um, from the data set that it's receiving. And it then determines the output or the FO2 to apply or the change in FO2 based on a series of um, coefficients, mathematical coefficients, which are based around how the change is occurring, whether there's big changes occurring frequently or small changes and where it believes that thing, the oxygen may be in the oxygen dissociation curve. Um, so it applies some um, predefined rules in that regard. Um, there is also some adaptive models on the market, which in these cases, they try to develop a mathematical model for the oxygen dissociation curve in that patient at that point in time, and therefore apply the relationship to SpO2 and FO2 accordingly. And the clinician has to set essentially how often it needs to readjust the model. Um, do these systems work? Um, indeed, we know, we, I'll get to that in terms of broader data, but we do know that they do work. Um, here's again some data from Peter Dargaville using the Oxygeni, which is a system that he invented, um, showing that with the algorithm in place in a small series of crossover babies on non-invasive ventilation with a target range of 90 to 94%, 
um, they were more likely to get into their eupoxic or desired range and stay there when the algorithm was on or off. And there was a reduction in hyperoxic effects uh, periods of time. There was also a reduction in severe hypoxic effects um, between the two groups. So they were much less likely to have saturations less than 80% in this small trial. Small trials are not enough. We should really look at where things are in a broader sense. Um, we do have a systematic review, a number of systematic reviews now of water by oxygen control in preterm infants, a total of 16 trials. All of them have been crossover trials rather than randomised control trials. All of them have had the same outcome measure as to, and which is, does the use of these systems increase the amount of time that you stay in your desired target range? So they're not long-term outcome um, trials. They're just, does the system actually work? Is it accurate? And does it reduce the periods of times of extremes of oxygen, hypoxia and hyproxia? And pulling all of these data, we see that indeed they do. You're about 13 times percent more likely to be in your saturation range when the system is on compared to manual control. There wasn't, uh, there is a reduction in hyperoxia. There was not a significant or major clinical change in hyperoxia, hyperoxia in total. There was a, a significant number in um, the number of severe hypoxic events. Another outcome measure that has been mentioned in these um, meta-analysis and I think is important to note is not just whether the devices are accurate, but what impact they have on your staff. Because the idea here is you're giving away control to a computer with a view that the nursing staff or the medical staff may be able to do other things. And indeed, the staff workload in the meta-analysis has reduced. Um, the staff are making a lot less manual adjustments of oxygen when the system is on, less than one per hour compared to on average 29 times per hour um, for babies being managed with manual oxygen control. And I think this is very important when we think about long-term benefits, and it may be that the benefits are important and not the ones for the baby, but ways we can indirectly help the baby with other things uh, by allowing the staff to focus on other tasks, which may have nothing to do with the lungs. Looking at each of the trials as they've been published, we can see here um, their results. Um, so this is each trial. You can see the percentage of time in target range for manual versus automated. And you can see that each one shows an improvement. There's some variability in the amount of improvement, but overall they all show roughly the same thing. So it tells us that these systems are accurate and they improve the amount of time that can stay in your target saturation range. The question though is what do we still need to know? And what we still need to know is, do these systems improve important neonatal outcomes? We have no randomised controlled trials comparing long-term outcomes in preterm infants. We have one single historical observation study where our reporting from a site that changed practice from always using manual control to always using automatic control, um, a total of almost 600 babies, about half in each group. There was no difference in major mortality, in mortality NEC, laser therapy or BPD. We do have one large RCT which is currently recruiting, which is looking at BPD as an outcome measure and other important respiratory um, outcomes that's anticipated to finish recruiting next year. I suspect with COVID and things, it might be a little bit later than that. The other thing is we need to actually ask ourselves what are the right outcome measures for clinicians to be using which might to help us make the decision about whether we want to adopt this technology in our NICU. As I said, short-term outcome measures may be the appropriate ones to use because it may be these short-term measures in terms of freeing up staff and making babies more stable that are just simply enough to adopt the practice change. Although I would like to see that there's no significant harm effect from these, and I'll get to that in a minute, I don't think there probably is. Um, it may be that the appropriate outcome measure is actually a medium term one. Is the use of um, oxygen, automated oxygen control going to enhance weaning? And indeed, there is some data suggesting that um, with automated oxygen control, babies are less, are going, will be in air or low FO2 quicker than when manual control is in place. And I think we still need to think have some guidance from the experts in these technologies as to what the right outcome measures are going to be. One little um, concerning um, bit of data around outcome measures is this small observational study using a PID algorithm um, from um, 
um, from Germany where um, they compared, they again showed that when the algorithm was turned on compared to manual control in this crossover study, you were more likely to be in SPO2 range. But during this study, they also measured um, brain, liver and kidney end organ perfusion using NIRS and found there was no difference in the end organ tissue perfusion or tissue oxygenation, sorry, um, when the oxygen control was on or turned off. We still don't know if the algorithm matters and as clinicians that's important to us because we would like to be able to know maybe which one's better if we're going to decide to use it. And in fact, we only have one comparative study that's been published so far. It's a single site crossover study from the Netherlands. Um, there's only 15 babies in each group and they were crossed over to an old rules-based algorithm, the original one, the Clico uh, algorithm, um, uh, and compared that to the PID algorithm in the Oxygenie. And again, using a target saturation of 91 to 95%. They were able to show that with the Oxygenie algorithm, the time and target range was significantly higher than using the older rules-based algorithm. Interestingly, the old algorithm, you're more likely to have hyperoxia compared to the new one. And with the Oxygenie, you were more likely to have periods where your oxygen was below target, but not associated with severe desaturations. We need to also remember that all of the current automated systems are linked to a ventilator, which means they're really only applicable in an ICU setting. There are many, many babies that would benefit, I think, from automated oxygen control if we had it in a blender and we could use it in less resource intensive environments where we often have less experienced nurses and higher ratios. And indeed, that's where the weaning side of things would come in. We have a recent point of principle study of a prototype oxygen blender, which incorporated the Oxygenie algorithm, which is called the VDL11 or Van Diemen Land 11 algorithm. Um, and this is a prototype that was invented by the Hobart group, uh, comparing 35 babies less than 29 weeks on non-invasive ventilation. And again, using this oxygen blender, rather than being built into a ventilator, they were able to show that there was more time into target saturation compared to manual control. We don't yet know about the right performances or the conditions to use this in, in other populations. All of the studies are being limited to preterm infants. So um, we don't yet know how this would um, automate oxygen control may impact on the management of term babies, and in particular, how it might impact on how we can improve support for cardiac infants. Um, who we know generally have a much lower saturation target. And in some cases, we don't worry as much as we would in preterm infants about the saturations. We also don't know the role it might have in infectious respiratory failure um, because we have to remember that not um, oxygen is provided to many children in the first year of life, many more than is provided in the neonatal period. In that regard, we are performing at the Children's Hospital the COTI study, um, which is a crossover study of, of two groups of babies, term infants with acute hypoxic respiratory failure, such as MAS and CDH, and also infants with proven lower respiratory tract infections, basically bronchiolitis. We've actually stopped this trial. Um, we have um, basically due to feasibility issues, and the main reason there's been a problem with feasibility is that... Um, we're two years into the COVID pandemic almost, and um, at least in Australia, the onset of the COVID pandemic has obliterated all other lower respiratory tract infections. And we have seen um, literally a small handful of babies with influenza or RSV bronchiolitis since March of last year. Um, I think in the interest of time, I might move on. This is, I was just gonna point out that this is one of the large crossover trials that this is probably the largest crossover trial, um, but I think I'll move on in the interest of time and really focus, so I'm almost finished. Um, so what do we still need to know? We still need to know are there any potential risks? And this is worth spending some time thinking about. Um, on face value, you would say there is not going to be, and I would be very surprised if in larger long-term outcome trials or medium-term outcome trials, we identify any of the classic risks that we would expect in a neonatal intensive care unit for our babies, because the observational data we've got so far shows that at least hypoxia and hyperoxia appear to be re reduced. Whether that's meaningful, baby, I don't know, but it's very unlikely that reducing hypoxia or hyperoxic events is going to be harmful or create an inadvertent adverse risk. Where though the potential risks exist is that an automated oxygen system requires us to rethink human factors. 
And I think this is something that we need to get our head around as we start to apply these technologies in our NICU and more and more we are. Firstly, what does an automated oxygen system actually treat? It's treating oxygen saturations. It's not treating why the oxygen saturation has changed or is not optimal anymore. So it is not treating the cause of the desaturation or the high saturation. It's simply treating the number. That's really important because whether we like it or not, all of us are using oxygen saturation instability as a clinical tool. If I have a baby, if I do my warning ward round and the nursing staff tell me this baby has been very unstable with its saturations all night, that's a red flag for me that that baby may have something going on. Maybe it's becoming septic. Maybe my ventilator settings are not right. Maybe there's too many secretions. If I use an automated oxygen control system, based on what we're seeing in the meta-analysis or systematic reviews so far, the oxygen, in the SAT instability will go down which means my clinical tool could disappear, but it doesn't necessarily mean the pathology that that baby has had is going away. That baby could still be getting septic. It's just the way I might be using to identify it has changed. So it may reduce our ability to diagnose the causes of instability. And for this, I think as a group, craft group, we need to think about alternative definitions of how we diagnose cardiorespiratory instability. The simplest one is instead of looking at the instability of SpO2, you look at the instability of the FO2, which is the linked mechanism here. And if you're seeing a baby whose FO2 graph is changing a lot and there's a lot of instability, then that should be telling you things might not be quite right. We might also need to start looking at other parameters such as heart rate variability, which is we know from our delivery room work is becoming the mainstay that we determine response to clinical care. So in summary, automated oxygen control can be used uh, during all modes of respiratory support. It's easy to use, it appears to be accurate, and it appears to reduce periods of hypoxia and hypoxia. Um, based on some of the studies that have been published so far, it may reduce our staff workload, but we don't yet know the long-term benefits and we don't know which groups are the precise ones that we need to be using it in. Um, thank you very much for your time. I think I've, I hope I've stuck to time um, overall, and I might just turn the screen off if that's okay. Um, and I'll hand it back over to the, the chairs. So I'm not sure um where are we going what what's the next phase we're going to open up for q a uh, that's right uh, rupa i'm i'll be handing over to rupa to um ask for a few questions yes thank you uh rupa you're on can you hear me now uh, so we have re received a few interesting questions from our audience, and I would like to, uh, you know, uh, start with their questions. The first question that we have received is, uh, you know, uh, that uh, we have received is from Deogiri Children Hospital, uh, from Dr. Kedar, and he asks us uh, your opinion on uh, using high frequency uh, as the primary mode of ventilation in uh, respiratory disorder uh, disorders of newborn so yeah whether we can use that as a primary mode of uh, ventilation so there's no doubt you can use it as a primary mode i'm, I'm not it, it's impossible to make a comment on all respiratory disorders of the newborn and that's very important nobody should ever be saying to anyone you should use it as a primary mode for all babies with all respiratory diseases because indeed there's some respiratory diseases i would very I would prefer, I would never use high frequency for, or at least try to reduce the use of it. Um, as a res rescue therapy, if one looks at the meta-analysis data from the large trials, at least in preterm RDS as rescue therapy, the data is, suggests a slight benefit, but it doesn't suggest an overwhelming benefit. So uh, most of us have interpreted that data to say that, um, the factors that will make the decisions around when you use high frequency and who are probably not based purely on the modality 
but are based on the team who at that hospital and their use and their ability to use that device. So I work in a unit that is um, a pro high frequency unit. We use it quite a lot. Um, we've had many, many decades of experience. So in that setting, we're much more likely to use it as a rescue therapy for some conditions than, than a unit down the road here in Melbourne, which uses it a lot less, uh, sorry, as a prophylactic therapy. Um, and we're much more likely to use it as early rescue. Um, so other units are going to use it as a, a later. So I think we know from our clinical experiences that in certain lung conditions, high frequency is an excellent respiratory therapy. So we know in babies with profound atelectatic disease, so that's very severe RDS, that's not responding to conventional ventilation with um, mean airway pressures of above, above about 12 to 14, it's very effective. We know, and this has been reproduced, it's shown in the Vermont and the uh, Australian New Zealand data sets, that high frequency is used very often in MAS as severe rescue, ther as rescue therapy in conjunction with nitric oxide. And indeed, there's lots of data there. Um, it looks like in the context of neonatal ARDS, which is pneumonia and MAS and various other conditions pulled together, that high frequency is being used by clinicians as rescue therapy. So I think if you have the staff who are trained to use it safely, who are trained to be able to apply, if you have the monitoring in place to be able to show how effective it is, then it's a good rescue therapy. But without training, it can be dangerous. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for that. And the uh, one question which I think we received uh, three or four Times and uh, you, uh, in your presentation, also you mentioned that this is uh, one of the most liked uh, topics of the uh, neonatal doctors. Here we have received that uh, you know they were asking who are the most suitable uh, candidates for high frequency, or uh, what are the indications when they you know when they are ventilating and they want to start HFO. So I know you have covered it, but in uh, quick, if you can, uh, 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 you know. Yep. So again. I think for most of us, high frequency, I think, yeah, I think for most of us, high frequency is a rescue therapy. Um, even in our unit where we use high frequency a lot, we will not use it prophylactically that often. We will generally use it as a rescue when other therapies have not worked. So let's uh, talk just purely around that concept of rescue therapy. So why would we use it to rescue? So we would use it to rescue because conventional ventilation is either failing that baby, that means it doesn't, it's not strong enough to be able to ventilate, mm -hmm. um, or conventional ventilation is potentially more dangerous for that baby. There's risks for injury associated with it. If we think about conditions where it may be failing, it is nearly always profound atelectasis, so severe uh, RDS, that's, as I've said, as I've just said before, that's not responding to high mean area pressures on conventional. Um, MAS, pneumonia and, um, and um, PI are, are other conditions where should generally so so severe um, hypoxia, um, which need lung recruitment. At the other end of the spectrum is a congenital diaphragmatic hernia group. Those group of babies, are, we have an early approach to rescue high therapy. We don't use it prophylactically, but we will have a very low threshold to use it as a rescue because we know in pulmonary hyperplasia that high frequency works very well in this group of babies. But they are a risky group because they have pulmonary hyperplasia. And if you apply it the same way you do with RDS, with a very high mean airway pressure, you'll cause lung injury and cardiovascular compromise. So there's a different strategy for CDH, but we would use that as a rescue therapy. I haven't talked about that. There's multiple guidelines available on the lit in the literature. They all say the same thing around how to use it. Um, in terms of a lung injury group, the other group we would use it a lot for um, as rescue is severe PIE, mainly because you're exposing the lung to less movement and therefore less risk of injury and severe chronic lung disease as a rescue therapy. But again, that's quite a complex disease to manage. We don't, we tend to do that slightly differently. It's probably another talk, um, but that's probably our, the, where most people be using it as rescue. All right. Uh, thank you. And uh, um, apart from this, we have received uh, questions where uh, 
you know they have given some situation like will intermittent non non invasive high frequency help in opening up of collapsed lung uh, in uh, cld uh, that is chronic uh, lung disease and uh, if if so what is your uh, what regime is your advice uh well, from kobay that, medical uh, that's medical. talking about um non invasive high frequency which i haven't spoken about in this talk because yes. whilst it is high frequency i it's not high frequency ventilation it's non invasive ventilation where we're applying a high frequency oscillatory wave into mm -hmm. the circuit and the mechanisms of action and the benefits are probably quite different um yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah. Did you want me to talk briefly about that? Uh, yeah, because there are a few more questions where mm -hmm. they they were uh, requesting your support to uh, uh, to understand what will be the setting. So, like another, the next question which uh, was asked was: uh, Can the same HFO setting be used as in ET? Uh, uh, no. To versus uh, you know non invasively when you they they are using prongs and masks. So this is another question which has come from our yeah. doctor. So generally, we, we do have some trial data on non-invasive high frequency. Most of us would probably use frequency of 10 hertz um, as a starting frequency. That's not based on um, trials that are compared different frequencies, but it is a, probably a good rational midpoint between what we need, um, acknowledging that the wave will be changed a lot more than it will on ET um, high frequency. Um, and most of us will set the delta p to to be able to show that the chest is wiggling um and, and generally you don't need to set it much higher than that so you just want to show that there's some chest wiggle um the complex thing is is exactly uh, is is the mean airway pressure you said mm -hmm. and here i think you need to think about what conditions you would use it for i think it's too simplistic to say oh we should just compare it to cpap for everything um, if you think about and again it's more like so if we think about issues around CPAP and non-invasive support we use CPAP to support extubation failure after a baby has been extubated and indeed the observational data that's coming out on nasal high flow in the units that have got experience with it are telling us that it reduces your risk of extubation failure compared to CPAP alone um, and um, it potentially may have some effect in apnea as well, which is another reason we would use CPAP. And I think in those two conditions or states, that's probably where the benefit may lie, although I don't know for sure. I suspect the benefit in apnea is that it creates a, a wiggle in the back of the throat and maybe stimulates the baby as much as actually helping the lungs. The trials that have been done on extubation failure have got a limitation in it, which, just need, which we need to work out. And, and, one of, and that big limitation is that they've generally compared CPAP with a certain mean airway pressure, and then they've gone to nasal high frequency at two centimetres of water above, like we do with ET high frequency. And it may be that the benefit then that we've seen in the reduction for re-intubation was not due to nasal high from the wiggle, but actually just doing a higher peak setting. So we have done, there's some work that um, we've published now from Melbourne here where we have compared nasal high frequency with, um, with CPAP using the same mean airway pressure and shown that there was transiently, uh, there was no difference in extubation. There was transiently an increase in FO2 in that group of babies, but there was better lung uh, behaviour in them when we looked at the imaging. So I think we have to... I, I, I'm not opposed to using nasal high frequency, but if you think that what the baby needs is just a high peak setting on CPAP, maybe you try that first and then try nasal high frequency. Um, the other thing is that not every baby likes nasal high frequency. Some babies will tolerate it. I've put it on some babies and their actual whole head is wiggling um, and they get quite distressed. Um, and we don't know if that's safe to have the whole baby wiggle because of mm -hmm. cerebral blood flow. So if a baby, if, if a baby's whole trunk, uh, head is wiggling and they're quite and they're distressed, I would not use it. So there's, it's not always tolerated for every babies, but there is now a number of sites that have used it for many years and reported good outcomes in their practice. So I think it's it's not a simple yes or no use it. You need to think about it. 
the next question is uh, uh, you know for how failure cases so here a doctor is asking uh, from jupiter hospital cpap is a mainstay of uh, non invasive ventilation in uh, heart failure uh, does high frequency provide adequate uh, peep in these uh, types of cases so doctor wants to know this yeah i think this is a question again around nasal high frequency rather than invasive high frequency so as invasive high frequency clearly provides very high mean airway pressures that's what it's designed to do i think the simple answer is in yes it does and indeed in the studies that have been conducted the intrathoracic pressure is higher during nasal high frequency that may be a response to having a higher mean airway pressure than the peak setting it also may be the contribution of the pressure but we do know that it will provide at least equivalent mean airway pressures um to cpap and even nipbv and and it does provide sufficient intrathoracic pressure so yes um uh, i think few questions came for uh, closed loop oxygen uh, control system one of them was uh, uh, which type of patients or clinical setup will be benefited with a uh, closed loop oxygen control uh, system feature well that's a very good question um because i think at the moment as i was saying we're not a, we it depends what you think is benefit we don't have any large trials of benefit in terms of reducing chronic lung disease or improving survival my suspicion is we won't see those data unless the use of closed loop oxygen results in a shorter duration of oxygen exposure and a shorter duration of ventilation so it's the the effect of automation on improving weaning outcomes um so in that situation who do i think it would be useful in and i guess some of this is not necessarily based on so firstly we don't have any data on term babies so we can't be sure if if it would work in term babies there's no reason why it shouldn't um but we don't have any data as i said we finished a, we've done a trial we didn't finish it to full recruitment we're now looking at analyzing that data because we don't think covid will allow us to keep it going much longer um and that will provide some insight around the term babies um where all the trial data exists is in preterm babies mm -hmm. and i think there's a number of group of babies where um closed loop oxygen i think will be quite useful so firstly in situations where you have very busy units yeah. with um very limited nursing staff um which is many units <laughs> so in that yes, way especially the government um, setups you know when they yeah. don't have one is to one ratio yeah so in that unit yeah where um you have um nursing ratios like that if you can if you've got good nurse educators who can train the nurses to use closed loop and doctors who'll support them then it probably is a good time to use it because you're going to increase your oxygen stability if we look at the data so far um but you need to train the staff and i have to say in our unit using closed loop we have had to train the staff the nursing staff really they like the idea of it so especially the inexperienced nurses because they can actually do some other work yes some um, people work yeah what the, no. it's actually the people who are most resistant are our senior nurses because a really experienced nurse and now I've actually watched this with come of our really experienced nurses they're actually as good as an automated system <laughs> as long as they're not doing other things over the years of training yeah. and practice makes them uh, that good. yeah and in that group of nurses the way we've talked the way we've been using it is to say to them you know when you can focus on the baby's respiratory care do so because the automated systems always aim for the mean spo2 yes. but in some of our babies that uh, uh, you know we may be wanting their sats just a bit like at the lower end of the range and a, and a nurse can be quite good at understanding when the right sat should be applied and then we've said to them well when you go and you scrub to do your tpn or you're checking drugs or you're covering someone else's break that's when you put the automated system on because you're not focused anymore so it's that sort of staffing factors the other group of babies are i think the babies who have that intrinsic liability or liability in their saturations so the preterm babies who are always having the a's and b's um but they're not having a's and b's because they're sick so it's not the baby who's having apnea bradycardias and desaturations because they're septic it's just that baby that's that 
you know, what we get in the NICU, the preterm babies are always all over the place with their saturations and it's just the way they are. That's the group of babies I think it's quite useful in because you will bring stability into those babies. Thank you. And I think the final, uh, can we take one more question? Is that okay? Yep. So uh, uh, another question which came was for how long or how many days can we uh, keep the babies on auto O2? And what are the other factors to be kept in mind when these babies are in auto O2 for a longer duration of time? Yeah, I think that's, that's a good question. And we don't actually know the answer yet because we don't have these long-term data. Um, what we have is a series of studies which have been crossover studies of either 12, 24 or 48 hours. Um, and we're only limited to people's experiences. So as a clinician academic, I can say I don't know how long you could use it for um, because I don't have data and I'd probably ask that question back to the manufacturers because they will have achieved approval, regulatory approval for how long it can be used for. Theoretically, it can be used as long as you want to use it because it's just a way of controlling saturations and FO, uh, controlling FO2. It's no different in that regard to having volume guarantee on during conventional ventilation. You know, it's allowing a computer to make decisions rather than a human. So mm -hmm. in that regard, there should be no limit but we don't have data to say, oh, yes, I'm absolutely sure that's the case. And indeed, we've left it on for a few days, but we generally use it in the context of clinical trials at the moment. Okay. Arpita, yeah. so, are you there? Yes. Thank you so much, Rupa, for the Q&As. And thank you so much, Dr. Tinge, for your patience in answering each one of them. I want to thank the audience again once more um, for uh, coming over for this session. And hopefully next year, uh, Professor Tinge, we should have you in person. Yes. Uh, thank you all. And we would like to mention it to the audience that you will receive the recording or you can find it in our YouTube page, which is GE Healthcare India. And thanks once again to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for the great questions.